Okay, well, we're starting a mini-series this morning about some dark and difficult days. The days in which Samson lived with dark and difficult days. Samson, the twelfth and the last <coughs> of the judges. So, this is a difficult day. <laughs> the day of the sermon of the introduction to the big picture of Samson. And when you start the series off, the introductory sermon is a nightmare. It's like a graveyard shift. It's like, oh dear, how do we deal with this? We take Samson and we try and set him against his background, we try and set him in his context. And we try and learn what he's about. And the big picture, the big message of Samson is what we're looking at this morning. Twenty years as a judge of Israel, coinciding with the forty years oppression of the Philistines, the people of God. He takes the last twenty years, the closing part of the shift, when the Philistines are oppressing God's people Israel. Mentioned in chapter 13 and verse 1, the second part uh, of that verse. The Israelites are in the thrall and the domination of the Philistines in his day. And there he is trying to leave the people of God and they're being dominated by these people from uh, the Philistines. So he probably ruled in terms of the backstory, which you'll find in chapter 12, verse 8 through into chapter 13, verse 1. He probably ruled from the Battle of Aphek. Remember that Israel was defeated, the Ark of the Covenant was captured in 1 Samuel 4, remember that? Who's done Sunday school? Who had Sunday school? It's quite a good story to colour in. You know the one? The Ark of the Covenant is captured and is taken away. Between that time and the Battle of Mizpah, when Samuel crushed the Philistines, ended their oppression in, in 1 Samuel 7. Samson then grows up during the time when Eli was the high priest of Shiloh, and that was basically all the leadership Israel had until Samson came along. During the time of the judges, it was, it was the, the priesthood that was organised. There wasn't a state going on. There wasn't organised government to help people to live uh, decently in an orderly way. Um, there was just the uh, sort of structure and order of government. There was just the, 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 the shrine of the Shiloh and the priests and telling people what to do and touching disputes and stuff for them. Now while the people were faithful, that was fine. They went up to Shiloh and they got what they needed. But in Samson's time, things have gone bad. And not even that is there. Israel is not so much a failed state as a state that just hasn't been established. There's nothing there. And the lives of the people are conditioned and are coloured by that. The spiritual consequences of that are pretty clearly established in the mind of the author of Judges. Because time and again he says something like this. Judges 17.6 In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Judges 19.1 Those days Israel had no king. Judges 21.25 In those... Uh, 17, 18, 19 and 21. 21, 25 In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Now get that. Because that's the big chime that runs through the whole thing. We've got this situation in the book of Judges where Israel had no structure and order government to give them a framework and a structure in which to live as the people of God. The thinking was a mess, the ordering of life was a mess, and everyone therefore did what was right in their own eyes. Does that ring any bells for you? Does that chime at all with what we've got today where Maybe not civil government, but certainly the structured patterns of thought have been decayed, have been taken away. Philosophically, we're going to account for that in terms of you know, secular philosophy and so on. That's what's happened. The structures, the order have been taken away. Are you surprised that everyone does what's right in his own eyes? Those are the days that Samson was called out for. So when we deal with young people, when we deal with anybody under the age of probably 30, the patterns of thought that are basic and fundamental to Christian faith aren't there. Because those foundations have been destroyed. And of course we are working in days when everybody does what's right in their own eyes. And decides for themselves what they think is going to be right and what's going to be wrong. And the consequences of all of that. Now if you're over a certain age in this congregation this morning, you'll see that. But if you're not, you haven't seen the other thing? And it doesn't sound, what I'm saying doesn't ring. Let's just look at Samson and see what's happening and see if it starts to ring any bells then. 
Two points of consciousness to remember then as we approach this outline of the life of Samson in the book of Judges. The Israel we're dealing with had no proper system of government, and the author of this book sees that as having definite spiritual and behavioural consequences. But secondly, Israel still lives under a divine commission in that state of disrepair. The commission to enter the promised land, to drive from it the utterly immoral Canaanite idolaters whose conduct had risen up to God and was a stench in his nostrils, whose continued presence in the land would make the people of God just as godless themselves if those Canaanites were not dealt with quite decisively. Driven back to a distance. Two things. No proper system of government, but this commission, this job. Drive out the Canaanites. Okay, historically, the backstory. And therefore the context of these events looks something like this. Eli, high priest up in Jerusalem. Samuel comes along towards the end of the time, properly God, by the time that Samson was just finishing his time as judge, just as the judge's period was ending. And the lesson of these last, the, the last chapter and these last days of the judges is really pretty stark. Good leaders pass. Good leaders pass away. At the end of chapter 12, it's really pretty stark, there's a list. Jephthah led Israel for six years, the previous major judge. Then he dies, says Judges 12. So. Then the author lists a set of less prominent judges that followed and died, all in rapid succession, giving the impression of the temporary nature of human leadership of the people of God. We tend to lean on our leaders and they go. They die. I'm not planning anything. But that happens, okay? We've just seen big church down in Cardiff, now good friends gone from there. And you can just see the church reeling at the moment. They're licking their wounds. Because the leadership has gone to the south coast of England to do something else. People lean on leaders and it's time to move on. And in this case, of course, these guys all die. Chapter 12, verse 8. After him, Ibzan of Bethlehem led Israel. After him, Elon the Zebulonite led Israel for ten years. After him, Abdon, son of Hillel from Pirathon, led Israel. Incidentally, that's all being set up for a huge contrast with the twelfth judge, who is Samson. Because all those guys were really rich. And Samson is, Samson is a poor area, but from the back end of Dan, you know, they were living in tents. Um, it, says in, in the te it says that he was living in a tent village. The Philistines were raiding the land. They had no settled place, no defence, and, and Samson was living as a, like one of these tent cities for, for, for um, refugees. These guys listed in the run of Samson incredibly wealthy. Here we go. Ibzan had 30 sons and 30 daughters. He gave his daughters away in marriage, that's 30 dowries, to those outside his clan. And for his sons, he brought in 30 young women as wives from outside his clan, bride prices to pay. If you're going to fund an operation like that, you need to be fairly wealthy. Especially if you live in a pastoral, wandering situation. Clearly a bigger mess, because he had 30, you know, offspring to think of, did not it? 30? He had 30 of each, 30 boys and 30 girls, didn't it? He's been busy. Abdon, on the other hand, another one comes along, very wealthy man. He had 40 sons and 30 grandsons who rode on 70 donkeys. That is quite a fleet to manage. It's a lot of transport in those days. The effect of it all was to paint a picture of Samson being a singular individual. A different sort of character. The final man in Israel's long list of judges, their 12th great tribal leader. No state, just a tribal leader. He's the guy who leads it. And at a time when leadership in Israel was sporadic, was characterful, was at best quirky, Samson stands out head and shoulders above them all in the oddity stakes. He's weird. He's really weird. And he's God's man for the job. A man is in a league of his own. A league of his own in terms of individuality. And when Bible colleges on this side and that side of the Atlantic all turn out guys in that mould, there are lessons to be learned here about God's use of individual character and individual personality. So, God is to be leaned on, as the leader's passing reminds us. The first lesson we learned before the announcement of the birth of this big, strong character, Samson, is the best of God's leaders will pass. 
That's the God's leader's past, and that's how this all comes to be. And then, the Israelites will do evil. The Israelites will do evil, and they do evil again in the eyes of the Lord. Chapter 13, verse 1. The Israelites do evil in the eyes of the Lord. When that former lot passed, it wasn't long before things went horrible amongst the rescued, ransomed, redeemed people of God. See, amongst them, the people of Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord. The Israelites, the chosen line, they did manifold, unspecified evil, and they did it as God reckoned it, in the eyes of the Lord. Now, now hang on. See that news item this weekend? about this euthanasia survey somebody's done. So somebody's done an athlete's euthanasia survey. And uh, <clears throat> what they found was interesting when it came to religious people. Now, we don't know how they've categorised who's religious and who's what, right? Because that's the way it is. But they've categorised a religious group. And it says, yeah, most religious people did think that euthanasia was a bad idea, like a bit more than 50%. Uh, but they opposed it not because of the image of God in humanity, not because God said it was wrong, but they thought it was just a bit dangerous that, you know, there might, might be a mistake and the wrong person will get killed. How is evil being defined there? It's not being defined as it's perceived in the eyes of the Lord. It's being perceived as probably what we define as being useful. Does that make sense to you? Sin is not a subjective judgment. It is not a matter of how sinful people see things. There's an important reason for that. It can't be a matter of how we see things because we're, we're swimming in this pool. You know when you go to the swimming pool? You go in the swimming pool and there's chlorine in the water and it gets in your eyes and you can't see straight? Yeah? You know that sort of experience? You go in the water and you swim around and you get the chlorine in your eyes, it burns your eyes a bit and you perspective it and you come out and, uh, 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 and you can't see straight. Here we are swimming around in all sorts of stuff that influences our vision, our sight. What's important here is that the Bible's not saying the Israelites did evil in their own eyes, but they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And there's a reason, there's a reason that becomes quite significant uh, a little bit later. So their leadership was removed to encourage reliance on God as their king again, but things went the other way and they did evil in the eyes of, spot the capital letters in the text, evil in the eyes of the Lord, Jehovah. The covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. It was their rescuer, their ransomer, their redeemer against whom they sinned and into whom they ran in their rebellion. And in days like ours, when sin is reckoned to be that which is defined as sin in the eye of the beholder, what we see as being wrong, that's an important distinction to make. Of course, a lot is down to their background with these people. Their sin is culturally conditioned. But that still leaves them no excuse for committing it. The Israelites do evil. And a lot of it is because of the background they live against. Can you see that little fellow there's a comedian, he blends in with his background. And human nature is a bit like that. Do you, do you find when you're chatting to somebody who's got a strong accent, do you find you start, <laughs> smiles around the room of recognition, you start kind of almost mimicking their accent a bit. And various ones of us do it to a different degree, you know, some, some do it really strongly and uh, there are certain accents, if I'm talking to somebody with that accent, oh, I've got to be really careful, because they'll think I'm taking the mickey, you know, it's very easy to do that, isn't it? We kind of blend, because we're human. The Israelites are called by their God to live against the background of Canaan. They moved in there. And their lifestyle and their identity is threatened by that. Because things that go on in Canaan are not great. There's the ancient Canaanite peoples, of course. But then there's the Philistine cities that have been established on, along the western seaboard. The Philistines settled over there on the coastal plain about 1200 BC, a generation or so after the Israelites entered the land of Canaan. And those Philistines got well established in their five cities, Gaza, Eshkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, and Gath. And then they started to push into the hinterland, which is where the twelve tribes of Israel were to be found in their loose tribal league. These are not the traditional settled people of the land, the Amorites and the Ammonites, that have been getting dealt with so far in the book of Judges. The sort of aggressive people 
that previous eras of judges had had to deal with for Israel, it was clear. They were aggressive. They were the enemy. They fought you. They came at you. You had to fight them back. It's not those people that Samson's dealing with. He's dealing with the new kid on the block, the sea peoples who come in, moved into an already threatening situation. And those first lines, because of their cities and their urban way of life, they're increasingly hungry for arable land. Land like the stuff Samson, Samson's tribe, the Danites, are sitting on. And they want access to that land. But the threat from the Philistines to Israel is quite different. They're not just coming in with their swords and saying, give us your land. They come in with a different approach. They come in to trade. This is critically important. They come in in like a, a friendly sort of way. The nature of the threat from the Danites is, is one of appeasement. The old enemy was clearly opposed to you. They were vital and brutal. But the Philistines came towards you as people you could do business with. You could approach them, you could negotiate, you could trade. In fact, you didn't need to approach them because they appeared friendly and came towards you. And they offered you things that you wanted and thought you quite liked the look of. And, and you wouldn't want to seem odd or do anything to threaten this good relationship you're building with these people. And the challenge is to resist the insidious allure of appeasement. What's appeasement? Not rocking the boat. Don't push it to a conflict. Now if you're going to understand Samson, and I know I've gone on a bit about this, if you're going to understand Samson, you've got to understand that that is what he's coming into. A situation where people have been insidiously drawn away from God. Quietly, nicely, sweetly, drawn quietly away. It's not like the Canaanites, war, right? It's, come and trade with us. It's a bit like, um, <clears throat> The Anglo-Saxons came into Britain, right, with swords, no, oh, fight, 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 okay? But the Vikings came into Britain primarily, we're going to trade, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And when we can't trade, then we'll nick stuff off you and go away. It's a different approach, do you see? And Samson came into that scene, and what Samson did was to throw down a marker, and that was a large part of what Samson is about. He is the one who dug in his toes in the midst of a compromised people, drew the line in the sand, and then defended it. He defended it alone, because nobody agreed. He's never got an army. He's never got a bunch of guys with him. Samson is the one man who's drawn the line in the sand, causing the aggravation that people then wake up to. And fight back. Does that make sense? That is the point of Samson. You wonder what the point of Samson was, all those funny stories we're going to be looking at. There's the point of Samson. It's pushing things to the point where everybody can see. Oh boy, we're going to be standing up to this. There's an issue here. Now, Samson, even this passage of scripture doesn't say that Samson ends the problem with the Philistines. He begins to deal with the problem with the Philistines. And the threat's going to outlive him. And the era of the judges, and even the early days of the monarchy, up to the reign of, of well, the united monarchy, and the king David, who finally deals with the Philistines. But Samson was the guy who took decisive action that ended the era of Philistine appeasement, pointed the issues, stirred up the hornet's nest, and so angered those powerful Philistines that appeasement and assimilation would no longer be an available option. That's the point of Samson. I know we've perhaps been through some of this because we've talked the stories, yeah? And we think, what is the point of him? I mean, why is he doing that? Why is he marrying her? Why is he, you know, Joe Bob and ask, what's that about? He's pointing up the drift that's taking place, the allegiances and the, and, and the treaties that have been made, as it were. Samson is the guy who draws the line in the sand and defends it when nobody thanks him at all for doing so, they think he's just a troublemaker and a, and, and a delinquent child for behaving in that way. Um, has anybody listening to the, um, the religious programme? It's called Sunday on Radio 4 this morning. Anybody? Well, there's an example. There's a party in Australia now, a new political party being launched, okay, by a bunch of evangelicals, charismatics, Pentecostals, I don't know what they are. They sound interesting. They started this party called Rise Up Australia. And what the guy on the radio was saying this morning was this. He was saying, look, 
you just you guys just don't realise the threat that Islam is to our country. And he says, just go and talk to any of these really nice sounding, really friendly, whatever, uh, Islamic people who are sort of, you know, integration and multi and all the rest of it. Ask them, do you or do you not want to see Sharia law established in Australia? He says, they all say yes. So now, do you want your children, your daughters, and your sons, to have to grow up as Christians under Sharia law? And he's doing something, whether he's right or whether he's wrong about all this. He's doing something rather like drawing a line in the sand the way Samson did and defending it, saying, hang on, there's an issue here. We all want to be friendly, we all want to get on. I'm sure we all do. Right? But there's an issue here. Is your aim in all of this that I'm taking on the chin and closing up to you about, is your aim to establish something that's going to be for the extreme detriment of the cause and the people of God? And that's what was happening with the Philistines. That's what was happening with the Philistines at that time. And whatever it actually is that's going on in our multicultural society, in our society where everything is the same and everything is equal and everything is right, we just need to be aware of that issue. And that's all I'm saying about it. It doesn't seem to have made Samson too popular to take this line, particularly in the eyes of his own people. Now, go bear this in mind too, Samson is a man of his age. Samson is also, like many a prophet before and after him, getting sucked into the doings of his own culture. And like Hazia, much later on, Samson gets sucked into an improper relationship with an improper woman in the course of his career as a prophet. In Hazia's case, it's to illustrate a point about the spiritual adulteries of the Israelites. Here with Samson, it was to uncover the spiritual distinctiveness that was being lost in this appeasement of the Philistines. Here's the lesson. Appeasing, appealing Philistines loses the favour of God. Maybe everybody standing around you will cheer at you and say, wow, wonderful, what a, what a liberal person, what a broad, what a loving, caring individual. But appeasing, appealing Philistines, if that's what they are, loses the favour of God. And the trouble is, it looks very appealing. Trade leads to intermarriage. Intermarriage leads to an appreciation of one another's culture, in that expression. Culture brings with it all sorts of things, in this case. Liberality, what a broad-minded individual. That's not where it ends up for the people of God, because again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they just thought they were blending into the background, like our friend the comedian. How did that happen? Mm. At the root of it lay appeasement, assimilating slowly and quietly with the people of the land, just drifting in the way you lie down and sink slowly and comfortably into a strange fellow bed. Look at that appealing feather bed they're sinking into. Canaan. What a place. It worshipped all manner of pagan deities, created things rather than the created God. Their worship artifacts have been dug up by loads of archaeologists who've written loads of stuff about it. What do they discover? They discover shrine prostitutes who participate in the religious rites. They discover a track record of violent, warlike, brutal activity. And they discover that their two chief deities were Baal and Asherah, symbolised by carvings of male and female genitalia, respectively. They worship Paul. Let's not get too superior about that. Because our society does too in its own little way. If you thought that in our porn-ridden, violent, image-loving society things have gone way, way too far, know this. The Canaanites actually worshipped statues of male and female sexual organs. They were as explicit as that. And oppression like that, Israel's sole and only hope is the Lord. Under pressure, what will God's people 
not uh, get the Israelites that evil in the eyes of the Lord. And there was nobody to draw that line in the sand with their toe. It's a great deal to show that in this bad situation, the Israelites went for appeasement. It's all very well to say that a list of the sins and the idolatry and the godlessness that Israel fell into, but that would detract from the point. Like chameleons, they blended into their background, and that was the heart of the problem. The people of God were different. You don't have to be as different as Samson, isn't that good news? But we have to be different. And that's what underlies all this stuff about Samson not cutting his hair and so on and so on. We'll get to that another time. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And God judged his people for it. And the evil that they did was simply to appease and to sink into the prevailing thought world from all around them. Some would say God should stand back and let them get on with it. Not so he doesn't. He steps in and he judges that sort of thing. And he's called us to distinctiveness. It is for not a whole list of sins. It is for appeasement and assimilation that God here judges the Israelites. How do you avoid that? How do you avoid that? Because day after day, coming at it is a particular view of the world, right? And that's okay. It's fine. Tolerance. Of what? We need to be conscious, first of all, and this is conclusion, conscious of potential for drifting. Very few of God's people actually come into trouble when the pressure is on. We come into trouble by drifting, assimilating, and appeasing. The power of the pressure of the people around us is always incredibly powerful. Be conscious of that. Be conscious that we need to counter sucking up to the world's values. We're here to be sucking up to God and His values. What He says is right. Be conscious of that. Because the world that we live in is in rebellion against this God, although it doesn't look like that. These Israelites, you know, they didn't see their own faithlessness. We need to be conscious of that. How do we deal with it? We deal with it by self-watch. Watching ourselves. Keeping an eye on what we're thinking and where we're going with our, our minds and our actions. And keeping that in in mind as we, as we read scripture, as we soak up again God's values, because constantly we're sucking up the values of the people around us, the world around us, the Philistines and the Canaanites. It's constantly coming at us. They come to you. And we don't want to seem unreasonable or irrational or unpleasant or not friendly. The nasty people. Sam says that it draws line and sound. Self-watch and buddy watch. You can't do Christian living outside of Christian community. No, really, you can't. It's really difficult. It doesn't work very well. Because in Christian community, as we come together, we get a check on our thinking from one another. Quite often it's enough to come in amongst your Christian friends to think, oh, oh yeah, I've got to watch that. Because you're inside a different plausibility structure, you're inside a different way of thinking as soon as you come together. And we have a great desire, don't we, to be a missional outreach community, the community of the people of God. But we need to take time also for being the people of God. And that check that we have on one another. Well, <clears throat> I don't want to go on too long, so I'm going to stop. Because that's, about, that's about as far as I want to go on. But... Can you see some of the issues here that underline the coming of Samson to be the leader of the people of God? The pressure of the world around you, 
you is such that it will form your thinking. Quietly, inobtrusively, slowly, you'll sink into it like sinking into a soft and strange bed. Was it memory from, is that it? But then it'll start to form and to shape and to sculpt your own spine. According to the shape you've fallen into. And Samson comes as that one. That singular individual, that absolutely stunning character. And what he does is he points out what's happening. And sometimes we need Samson's to do that for us. And it will help us to, uh, to consciously watch the thinking that we develop and to found it, establish it in the eyes of the Lord. Amen.